All right, well, let's get back to, uh, back to the plains. In the early summer of 1864 in Colorado Territory, uh, in, the, uh, in the Denver area, there had been uh, several ranches that had had livestock stolen, horses and cattle, by uh, Cheyenne and Arapaho warriors. Um, it, was, uh, it was a difficult time. Uh, the war was going on, the Civil War, the uh, uh, crops that uh, the, uh, the Indians were being, quote, introduced to weren't doing so well. And remember, there were quite a few Cheyenne and Arapaho who had not gone on to the reservation there at Sand Creek. Uh, the uh, uh, chiefs who had signed off on that were really in, in the minority. Anyhow, um, a lot of uh, livestock was being taken, and in some cases, uh, the, uh, the Indians were, were seen um, by the settlers, and in some cases, they, they gave chase, um, but there was no violence attached uh, to it at that point. It seems as though this was not a concerted war effort, but uh, an effort to get food on the part of the Indians. However, there was, uh, there was one ranch where things turned out very differently. And that was, uh, that was a ranch uh, just south, uh, southeast of Denver, owned, owned by a guy named Isaac Van Wormer. Okay, now, by the way, the photograph is not of uh, uh, anyone that we're talking about here. It's just to show you kind of a typical frontier family and a typical frontier home. All right, so Isaac Van Wormer owned this ranch, and he had uh, several hands <clears throat> that worked there, uh, including one that he had uh, hired to be essentially the, the manager of the ranch. Uh, it's a small ranch. Uh, and that guy's name was Nathan Hungate. So Nathan Hungate and his family lived there in a cabin on the uh, Van, Van Warmer uh, property. He also had a, a hired hand that worked for Nathan uh, or under the supervision of Nathan by the, name of, by the name of Miller. So the Hungate family were Nathan and his wife, Ellen, they were both in their 20s. Nathan was 29 and Ellen was 25. And they had come to Colorado from Illinois. And they had, they had two children. They had two little girls. One was uh, two and a half years old, um, just shy of, uh, actually, maybe a little more than two and a half, just shy of three. The other one was uh, an infant girl, about six months old. Uh, so Laura was the uh, two-year-old and Florence was the was the six month old. Well, we know what ultimately happened. The cabin was burned down and the family was killed. A um, couple of different versions of, of how that played out. One, the one that was reported at the time and has been most widely accepted, is that Nathan Hungate and the ranch hand Miller were out looking for missing livestock. Uh, which indicates that perhaps uh, you know the the people who had been stealing livestock from surrounding ranches had had hit them. So they're out looking for livestock, but then they see heavy smoke coming from the direction of the Hungate home. Uh, so Nathan immediately wanted to rush back there and and uh, make sure his family was okay. Miller said uh, essentially, "To heck with that! They're dead if there's smoke." So I'm I'm heading to Denver. Uh, so Miller leaves the story. Uh, in this version, Nathan comes back and sees his family has been massacred, and then he himself is captured and is uh, is killed. So that's the uh, commonly accepted version. Um, however, in, in recent years, uh, Colorado historian Jeff Broom, who has done a lot of uh, a lot of research into the archives has come up with an alternate explanation. So uh, we'll look at that alternate explanation in, in a second. So first of all, um, the, just the, the basic facts, the, the family was 
was killed. The wife and the two children were killed. And then uh, the husband was shot 80 times um, when, he, when he returned. All right, well, the alternate theory uh, that Broom has is that Nathan uh, Hungate, the husband, was, was at home at the time of the attack because because Broom asks the question, why? And by the way, the Indians who did this were never identified. Um, there were conflicting conflicting opinions about the evidence left behind as to what kind of uh, Indians it, it might have been. Uh, but uh, Broom questions why with so many um, incidents of livestock being stolen, probably for food, and no efforts to attack anybody, and uh, not even efforts to attack some of the ranchers who kind of caught them at it and gave chase to them, why then would this whole family be killed? Um, Broom uh, speculates that because because there were several weapons found inside the burned down cabin, weapons that were damaged by the fire, uh, that indicates that the cabin was burned down first and then the people were killed, rather than the people being killed and then the cabin being burned down afterwards, because the Indians would have gone into the cabin and taken stuff, including these weapons. Um, so the, uh, the speculation Broom has is that uh, that Hungate had uh, caught them in the act of, of taking some of his livestock and had fired on them and perhaps uh, hit one or maybe even killed one or more of them, which would then explain the, uh, the, the attack on, on the cabin, the, uh, the revenge-motivated attack that would then be, and also explains kind of the... Uh, uh, the anger uh, that was uh, indicated by uh, Hungate's death, you know, uh, shot 80 times. Ammunition is, ammunition is expensive. Uh, so Brim speculates that there had to have been some reason for that. However, regardless, uh, the facts are the family was killed and there had been Cheyenne and Arapaho seen in the area taking livestock. So when news of this reached Denver, um, people just kind of uh, got, they got a little hysterical, understandably, and there was a whole lot of anger. In fact, uh, the governor of the territory was quoted as saying that uh, essentially we just need to find all Cheyennes and kill them wherever they are, uh, regardless. So that was, uh, that was sort of the, uh, the mood there in the Colorado Territory in the summer of, of 1864. The Cheyenne dog soldiers and their Arapaho allies were in fact making raids, mostly, mostly in Kansas and Nebraska. And all this became part of what is known as the Colorado War, which was not confined to Colorado. Meanwhile, <clears throat> in Colorado Territory, the um, local uh, cavalry uh, militia commanded by Colonel John Chivington was uh, having little dust-ups and skirmishes with some of the uh, Cheyenne and Arapaho. And the aforementioned governor uh, of Colorado Territory, John Evans, was... Really, I mean, I said that he had called for basically the, the killing of all Cheyennes. He was really stoking the fires of the uh, um, public mood, as was Chivington. Uh, in fact, the bodies of the Hungates were displayed in Denver for people to come see and, uh, you know, to, to further stoke their anger. In addition to the, uh, the husband, Nathan, with his many gunshot wounds, the wife, um, had been stabbed multiple times. All three females had their throats cut. The two children almost to the point of being decapitated and the infant had uh, been eviscerated 
And all this was put out on display. Uh, the newspapers were, were crying for, for vengeance and the eradication of all Indians. Some people have, uh, have hinted that perhaps Chivington had some political aspirations uh, and the fact that uh, from the point of view of the Cheyenne and Arapaho in Colorado Territory, uh, many of them felt that they were being constantly harassed by the uh, uh, volunteer cavalry. Um, there's some speculation that he was trying to, uh, you know, have some really big victories against Indians that he could uh, translate into a, a political career. Chivington was a, a former Methodist pastor, uh, and he had served, as had many of the people in the Colorado militia, uh, previously in that Battle of Glorieta Pass that I mentioned down in New Mexico that was, that was so important. George Bent, if you'll remember, the son of the guy who had uh, set up that trading post on the Santa Fe Trail back in the 1830s, he is, by this point, um, he has uh, gone back to live with his mother's people, uh, the Cheyenne, uh, and so he was one of the warriors who was involved in some of these skirmishes. He'd speculated, he speculated that uh, Chivington was trying to uh, basically manufacture a large Indian threat uh, so that he wouldn't have to uh, go fight more Confederates in, in Kansas. Uh, although I think that the uh, political aspirations might be, might be more believable. Either way, uh, there was a continued intense anger among the, uh, among the settlers, among the people, uh, the white people, in, in Colorado Territory. In August, Governor Evans issued a call for volunteers for the 3rd uh, Colorado Volunteer Regiment, 3rd uh, Colorado Cavalry, uh, that said, uh, attention Indian fighters, uh, promising, uh, promising equal pay to regular cavalry, a 100-day enlistment, so a little, over, a little over three months, to go on a punitive expedition to, to punish the uh, Cheyenne and Arapaho warriors who had committed these depredations. Now, I mentioned that, um, that both the governor and Chivington were stirring people up. Chivington, in a, uh, in a public speech, said, Damn any man who sympathizes with Indians. I've come to kill Indians and believe it is right and honorable to use any means under God's heaven to kill Indians. Kill and scalp all. Big and little, nits make lice, end quote. For those of you uh, who don't, uh, who are not up on your, your, your lice terminology, a nit is a baby louse. So in other words, kill them when they're small because they're just going to grow up and you'll have to kill them later, he says, and scalp them and anything else uh, that you have to do or essentially, I guess, that you, that you want to do. So among... Among the soldiers who were in this 3rd Cavalry uh, under the command of Chivington was a company commander, a, a captain, Captain Silas Soule. Uh, remember him. Uh, he's, going to, uh, he's going to play an important role in what, uh, in what unfolds. Now, that was in August. In September, uh, Black Kettle and some of the other uh, Cheyenne and Arapaho leaders met with the governor, uh, suing for peace, um, essentially saying, you know, uh, uh, we haven't done, we haven't done anything wrong. Everyone wasn't responsible for things that may have happened. And uh, they were told by the governor that if they were peaceful, all peaceful Indians uh, needed to not only confine themselves to that reservation area uh, that the Treaty of Fort Wise had restricted them to, but he said that uh, essentially, you know, to, to prove that your, your peaceful intent, uh, you should all gather together in one big village uh, there along Sand Creek. And uh, he was also told, Black Kettle was told, that just in case, because he was a little bit worried 
about still being attacked. And uh, he was given an American flag and said that uh, if anyone tries to attack you, uh, just wave that American flag and they'll know that, that you're on our side uh, and essentially everything will be cool. Uh, so uh, there were some captives, about seven captives that had been taken in raids by the dog soldiers and Black Kettle and the others uh, negotiated to get those captives and exchange them, uh, get them back to the, uh, uh, the territorial uh, government in return for uh, some captives on their side. And George Bent was uh, one of the translators that facilitated that. So Black Kettle and Little Raven, remember him, he was one of the Arapaho leaders who had signed that uh, Fort Wise Treaty. They led uh, their, their people, uh, the ones who didn't want to be involved in, in any kind of uh, warfare or conflict, led them back to the, uh, to the reservation and uh, set up camp as directed along, uh, along Sand Creek. Chivington's third volunteer Colorado cavalry spent most of the next three months, uh, the fall of 1864, traveling around trying to find uh, any of the, the bands of uh, Cheyenne dog soldiers or hostile uh, Arapaho allies unsuccessfully. Uh, they didn't find anybody, which led to uh, the local newspapers making fun of them. Actually, they started referring to them as the Bloodless Third. If it's true that Chivington was an ambitious person who hoped to parley success in an Indian war into possibly some political office in the future, uh, his one big shot at it not panning out and instead uh, leading to him being the object of ridicule was, uh, was not what he was looking for. So toward the, uh, toward the end of November, uh, as the, uh, the 100 days was about to expire, um, finally, uh, Colonel Chivington came to the conclusion that if he couldn't catch the dog soldiers, but he needed to kill some Indians, he knew where there were some at. Uh, they were at Sand Creek because he was there when they were told that's where they were supposed to be if they were peaceful. So he, uh, he took the, uh, the third and, and picked up some, some troops also from the uh, first Colorado uh, volunteer cavalry and with around 700 men and several cannon made his way to Sand Creek and surrounded, surrounded the village with his cannon and ordered his men to charge. Now, two of his men, two company commanders, viewed this as an illegal order and refused to comply. And in fact, had their companies, and the company's about 80 men, had their companies hold back and not move forward. And those were Captain Silas Soule that we mentioned earlier um, and uh, Lieutenant Joseph Cranmer. No one else, uh, no other company commanders did that, however, and all the others rushed forward and the, uh, the cannon began to fire. Now, as the soldiers were approaching, Black Kettle came out and stood in front of his teepee and began to wave the American flag as he had been told to do. And in fact, he had attached to the, the same uh, flagpole a white flag of truce. So he's standing there waving that around furiously, hoping to, uh, hoping to convince these troops that were attacking that they were peaceful, but that was to no avail because the troops who were attacking knew that they were peaceful. Now, there were no dog soldiers here. There were a um, couple of hundred, between two to 300 people in the village. Uh, all told, uh, completely the complete number is about 75 men. Uh, and those 75 men, 
for the most part, were those who were either too old to hunt or to go on a, a, a war uh, raid or too young. Uh, the, just a handful of actual fighting age men in the village. And here is another view of the same thing, Black Kettle waving his flag as, as drawn by an actual Cheyenne eyewitness. This, uh, this image is from a winter count on, uh, on that uh, Cheyenne artist's teepee. So this is, how, this is how he commemorated and remembered the year 1864. I'm going to give some details of this of this attack, and uh, these details are disturbing and they're graphic. And every time I talk about this subject, I always kind of grapple with this as to just how much detail that I should give, um, you know, because of uh, uh, possible, uh, you know, the the trauma that's involved. Uh, but I always come down on the side of at least giving some of the clinical details because it's very important to understand exactly what we're talking about in this instance and what makes this different from other occasions. And there are many other occasions, some of which we're going to talk about, in which the United States Cavalry uh, charged, into, uh, charged into Native American villages and, and killed uh, women and children, uh, how, uh, how is this different from any of those? Well, we really have to examine that. And you need to remember that um, this was not the United States Cavalry regular army. Um, this was uh, Colorado militia. So that means it's not soldiers who had been sent from somewhere else. Uh, these, uh, these soldiers were 100-day volunteers from the area who were subject to all the, uh, the prejudices and passions against the Cheyenne and Arapaho that people in the area would have had, particularly considering the fact that in the short time that there had been a large number of settlers in that area uh, with the uh, discovery of gold in Pikes Peak in 1859, so just five years, there had been a lot of tension between the locals and the Indians, and there had been several incidents, uh, including that uh, that Hungate massacre that we talked about, and all the newspapers inflaming everything. So bear that in mind. Okay. So what happened was um, the, uh, uh, the the soldiers under uh, Chivington's command came charging into the village, sabers flashing, guns blazing. Uh, and there weren't really a whole lot of fighting age Cheyenne or Arapaho men present. By the way, Little Raven uh, was not there. He had camped uh, his band farther away from this main village where the other Cheyenne and Arapaho were. So uh, uh, he didn't perish in this like uh, a lot of other uh, Cheyenne and Arapaho did. Well, over the course of this attack, remember there's about 700 or so soldiers. 15 of them were killed, and more than 50 of them were wounded. According to most accounts, the largest number of the wounded were a result of friendly fire because uh, the shooting was just indiscriminate. And also, a lot of these soldiers had been drinking heavily before the attack started. Some of them, though, uh, no doubt were wounded or killed by the the small amount of defense that the, the Indians were able to put up. So that's what happened on their side. 15 killed. On, on the other side, somewhere between 150 and 200 Indians were killed in this attack. Um, Two-thirds of them were women and children. One-third were adult males, but many of those were elderly, and some of those barely qualified as, as adult. Uh, so somewhere between 150 and 200 killed. Well, the, uh, the killing was, uh, it was just absolutely 
unregulated. Not that uh, you know, regulating killing sounds like a strange thing, but this was this was mayhem, um, and, and mayhem and worse. So, what happened was that while a lot of the participating soldiers really just went wholeheartedly into this slaughter, this massacre of of innocents, many. Uh, did not, including those two companies that didn't even go in, but even among those who were ordered in, some of them were deeply, deeply disturbed by the things that they saw and started talking about it afterward. Um, not that there needed to be a lot of talking because uh, word got out pretty quickly, as we will see. But um, some of those people were able to give eyewitness accounts from the, from the side of, of the soldiers of the things that were going on. Uh, and here's, here's one from a Major Anthony that was uh, quoted in the New York Tribune. There was one little child, probably three years old, just big enough to walk through the sand. The Indians had gone ahead and this little child was behind following after them. The little fellow was perfectly naked traveling in the sand. I saw one man get off his horse at a distance of about 75 yards and draw up his rifle and fire. He missed the child. Another man came up and said, let me try the son of a bitch, I can hit him. He got down off his horse, kneeled down and fired at the little child, but he missed him. A third man came up and made a similar remark and fired and the little fellow dropped. So there they were making sport out of, uh, out of killing a three-year-old child. Uh, there were also uh, reports of pregnant women being ripped open and the fetuses being ripped out of their womb. Um, there were reports, uh, well, uh, here's one specific report. Also, um, well, this is uh, uh, quoted in a work by Stan Hoig, but this is one of the eyewitnesses at, at court later on uh, who said, fingers and ears were cut off the bodies for the jewelry they carried. The body of white antelope lying solitarily in the creek bed was a prime target. Besides scalping him, the soldiers cut off his nose, ears, and testicles, the last for a tobacco pouch. And white antelope was, was not the only uh, male victim whose, whose scrotum was made into a tobacco pouch. There were there were others, and there were reports of women's breasts being cut off and made into pouches, and of vaginas being cut open and women's organs being cut out and made into hat bands. And in fact, uh, quite a large number of the soldiers took noses and, and ears uh, and various other body parts, including genitalia from men and women. Uh, and attach them to their swords and rifles, decorating them. Um, and uh, in at least one case, uh, an unborn child's body uh, being used uh, uh, as a decoration. And they rode back uh, into the city of Denver with these grisly items, showing them off right there in the middle of town, going from saloon to saloon, and... For the most part, the people of Denver were just eating it up and celebrating roundly uh, and voicing approval for this kind of behavior. Um, a lot of this had happened after the initial uh, onslaught when uh, a handful had managed to escape, many had been killed, and then the soldiers went through the village uh, teepee by teepee and uh, killed the, uh, the wounded and proceeded to scalp every single one of the bodies uh, from, from infants uh, all the way up to uh, old men and women. I have to be, I have to be honest, every time that I uh, give this lecture or talk about this subject, and, and I've done so at least a couple of dozen times over the years, it, it really it gets to me, uh, and uh, even today, I've had to uh, I've had to pause in my recording two or three times just to kind of just to kind of gather myself because this is not uh, at all enjoyable to talk about or to think about, 
And uh, that's true for me. It was also true for uh, people who heard about it at the time, including this individual that uh, we've talked about already just uh, recently, Kit Carson. This is a picture of him from later in life than the earlier photograph. Kit Carson, of course, uh, as we mentioned before, was, was a mountain man before he became uh, a colonel in the Union Army. Uh, and uh, at the time that this was going on, he was actually down in Texas fighting, fighting Comanches. In fact, uh, the uh, massacre at Sand Creek happened on November 29th, just about, I think, four days, four days after the first battle of the Adobe Walls that Carson was, was involved with. Anyhow, after he had heard about what happened, um, he was talking later to uh, another Union Colonel, uh, James Rustling, and, and this is what Kit Carson had to say about it. Just to think of that dog Chiffington and his dirty hounds up there at Sand Creek. His men shot down squaws and blew the brains out of innocent little children. You call such soldiers Christians, do you? And Indians, savages? What do you suppose our Heavenly Father, who made both them and us, thinks of these things? I tell you what. I don't like a hostile redskin any more than you do, and when they are hostile, I've fought them, hard as any man. But I never yet drew a bead on a squaw or papoose, and I despise the men who would. Well, as we saw, the people of Denver and many of the rest of the people in Colorado Territory did not agree with, with Kit Carson. Uh, they were just pleased as punch about what had happened for the most part. However, there were lots of people, uh, some people in Colorado, but lots of people around the country who uh, agreed more with Carson. And that included the, uh, the high command of the United States Army and uh, quite a few members of Congress to the extent that uh, uh, Chivington was brought up on military charges. There were hearings held uh, looking into what had happened. He, had, he, he was claiming that uh, uh, most of the, that he'd killed six or 700 Indians and almost all of them had been warriors, which was you know, the furthest thing from, from the truth. And because of these hearings, this is why we know so many details about what happened because it was entered into the court record by some of the soldiers who were willing to testify. And chief among these was Captain Silas Soule, the one who had refused to order his men into the fray because he believed it to be an immoral and illegal order. And he testified against his commander and it was very, very damning testimony. And oddly enough, a couple of weeks later, Captain Soul was was mysteriously murdered. Now, I think that uh, uh, the events that, that happened were absolutely, this is me talking, by the way, absolutely a horrible stain on uh, America, in American history and on the U.S. Army and military. Uh, but I think that, uh, that Silas Soul should, uh, should be recognized as a hero. Here's the conclusion that was reached by one of those uh, hearings, the one that was held by the Joint Committee on the Conduct of the War. Uh, and that panel uh, declared the following quote. As to Colonel Chivington, your committee can hardly find fitting terms to describe his conduct. 
wearing the uniform of the United States, which should be the emblem of justice and humanity, holding the important position of commander of a military district and therefore having the honor of the government to that extent in his keeping, he deliberately planned and executed a foul and dastardly massacre, which would have disgraced the veriest savage among those who were the victims of his cruelty. Having full knowledge of their friendly character, having himself been instrumental to some extent in placing them in their position of fancied security, he took advantage of their inapprehension and defenseless condition to gratify the worst passions that ever cursed the heart of men. Whatever influence this may have had upon Colonel Chivington, the truth is that he surprised and murdered in cold blood the unsuspecting men, women, and children on Sand Creek, who had every reason to believe they were under the protection of the United States authorities, and then returned to Denver and boasted of the brave deed he and the men under his command had performed. In conclusion, your committee are of the opinion that for the purpose of vindicating the cause of justice and upholding the honor of the nation— prompt and energetic measures should be at once taken to remove from office those who have thus disgraced the government by whom they are employed and to punish as their crimes deserve those who have been guilty of these brutal and cowardly acts. So that doesn't really leave uh, a whole lot uh, to the imagination or to doubt as to uh, how they felt about Colonel Chivington, uh, that they felt he should be removed from office. Now, what Chivington actually did was resign. He resigned his commission in February of 1865, just three months after, uh, after the massacre. And once he resigned, then military justice had no hold on him. What are they going to do? You know, fire him? Uh, and so any justice would have to be undertaken by the people of Colorado, Colorado Territory, and as you can probably guess, that wasn't going to happen. So essentially, um, he got off. Uh, he got away pretty much scot-free for these uh, heinous actions. Um, however, he didn't, uh, he didn't have the political career he had been angling for. Uh, he was kind of uh, persona non grata outside of Colorado. Um, he had some, uh, well... Uh, a couple of failed businesses at one point. He skipped off to, to Canada to avoid some of his debtors. Apparently uh, um, seduced his daughter-in-law and ran off with her and, and, and married her until she left him uh, for failure of support. Um, so, you know, he didn't have an auspicious remainder to his life, uh, at least. And in 1996, in view of the fact that Chivington had been a lay Methodist preacher, the, uh, the United uh, Methodist Church issued an official apology to the Southern Cheyenne people for, for the behavior uh, of, of, one of, of one of their own. Which might lead you to the question, gee, I wonder what the Indians thought about all this. Well, you can imagine what they thought about it. The, uh, the dog soldiers who had refused to be confined to that reservation to begin with uh, offered this up as evidence they were right, uh, that they were right all along. Uh, many others who had uh, been a little more inclined, perhaps toward, uh, toward peaceful resolutions, no longer were after this. Quite a few Cheyenne and Arapaho people uh, left Colorado Territory and joined the Lakotas in the Black Hills. Uh, Lakotas were having some issues of their own, as we'll talk about a little later. There had been uh, uh, gold discovered uh, in the Powder River country, and there were more and more miners uh, going uh, through Lakota territory on the Bozeman Trail, so uh, the Lakotas had uh, started raiding them, uh, and now they find out what happened at, at Sand Creek with their allies, their close allies, the Cheyenne and Arapaho, plus what had just happened a couple of years before to their, uh, to their kinsmen, the Dakotas in Minnesota, many of whom had come and joined them as well. Now, the United States, realizing that this was, uh, this was going to be a big problem, very embarrassed by what had happened at Sand Creek, 
uh, tried to smooth things over. Although, how are you going to smooth over something like what I just described? Uh, that's one of the reasons, aside from the moral outrage, that the uh, high command of the regular army was was so upset, you know, because they're fighting a civil war uh, that's taking, uh, you know, takes quite a bit of resources. And in the middle of it, you don't want to infuriate a whole lot of uh, native tribes. And yet that's exactly what had happened. Uh, they offered uh, to make a deal with the uh, remaining Cheyenne and Arapaho and even offered to give them extra annuities. Uh, but the uh, war leaders of the Cheyenne and Arapaho refused to meet with them uh, because they're, they're pretty hot uh, by this time. In fact, a couple of the Lakota bands, and remember there are seven bands overall, two of those Lakota bands, the Brule and the Ogallala, uh, actually entered into an alliance with the Northern Cheyenne and the Southern Cheyenne. And the Northern Arapaho and the Southern Arapaho, right after Sand Creek, to uh, to exact some vengeance on uh, on the white people, particularly in Colorado Territory. And uh, here are a couple of the a uh, couple of the leaders that were involved in that. On the left, you see a guy named Spotted Tail. Uh, he was a uh, a chief of the Brule. Lakota. On the right, you see a Cheyenne warrior named Roman Nose, which wasn't actually his Cheyenne name, because why would Cheyennes call someone Roman Nose? Uh, his name was Hook Nose, and uh, that's just kind of how the, uh, how the Americans interpreted that, uh, a Roman or aquiline nose, meaning like a big hook nose. So kind of a weird name, uh, but that's the one, that's what the Americans called him. Uh, he was a very prominent warrior, but he had been inclined toward peace. He was not a dog soldier. He was a member of the Crooked Lance Society. But now, now that those days are gone, uh, and so he uh, and his his uh, his band join up as well. Now, I, I have these folks here. I don't have a photograph of Roman Nose. There are no photographs of of that individual, though there are several that claim to be of him. Um, but there are actual no, um, no verifiable ones. But I put them there because both of these guys are going to show up again after this conflict. Roman knows pretty soon and spotted tail way down the road. All this was still officially part of the Colorado War. So the, the map that I have here shows a lot of the things in the early part of that war, the, uh, uh, the things there, Big Timber Creek uh, and Ayers Column in May, uh, that was 64, that was, uh, that was some minor skirmishes. And then you've got uh, three other battles listed there that were also uh, skirmishes in the efforts to, uh, to try to uh, pin down the, the dog soldiers after that, that uh, Hungate massacre. Uh, the uh, uh, Sand Creek village is represented by a teepee right there next to Pawnee Fork. So after Sand Creek, uh, as, as, as mentioned, the Oglala and, and Brule uh, had gotten together with the uh, Northern and Southern Cheyenne and Arapaho. And they came back into Colorado Territory to wreak vengeance. Over a thousand warriors uh, with the uh, three tribes uh, combined. And uh, they, uh, they struck the town of Julesburg, which is up there near the uh, North Platte River, right there by Camp Rankin, and pretty well destroyed the town. Um, most of the townspeople managed to make it nearby into the fort which only had about uh, 60 soldiers, but was a fort, and they were able to, uh, to stay safe in there. I think about 14 or 15 people were killed altogether. Then after that, um, this was in January, uh, so just a little over a month after Sand Creek. Uh, throughout the rest of January, there were uh, raids 
in small ranches all around uh, the western part of Colorado Territory. A couple of the more um, destructive and famous ones are are listed here. The uh, uh, attack on the American Ranch and on the Godfrey Ranch. Then in February, there were there were skirmishes with the uh, with the uh, military uh, at uh, in Mud Springs and Rush Creek, both in Nebraska Territory. So what happened was. <clears throat> This large force came in to Colorado, Nebraska, spent about um, six weeks raiding and fighting, and then headed west toward Wyoming uh, to join up with the larger Lakota force uh, there where they lived, uh, or where they were operating, at least at that time, in the Powder River country. Uh, along the way, in July of 1865, they uh, had another encounter with the U.S. Army at a place in Wyoming called Platte Bridge. Uh, in that one, there was a uh, young Ogallala warrior named Tashunka Whitco, who uh, proved himself exceptionally brave in that battle as he had in the previous battles. And as a result of his actions in that battle, he was he was uh, designated a shirt wearer, uh, which is a special war shirt, which means essentially he's now a war chief. So remember him, Tashunka Whitco, or as he's known in English, Crazy Horse. So at this point, um, Black Kettle, by the way, had not gone on any of those raids, he nor his band, nor did they head off to Wyoming. They did the opposite. They headed south, uh, down into Indian territory, uh, along with uh, quite a few of the southern Arapaho. And not long after, Black Kettle's band, his Cheyenne band, and their, their Arapaho allies uh, agreed, because again, they're trying to, they're not want not wanting to get revenge. They're not uh, at war they're wanting peace. So they agreed, again, to go to a reservation and uh, locate themselves in a particular spot where the U.S. government told them to be and told them they would be safe. In fact, uh, they told them that this new land in Indian Territory would be theirs as long as the grass grows and the river flows. And that was uh, along the Washita River. So uh, we will be revisiting them later. We will also be revisiting that force of uh, Cheyenne and Arapaho who went uh, west to Wyoming to join up with the, uh, the Lakotas. Uh, which, by the way, what was significant about the Colorado War, this last part of it, this series of raids in January and February 1865, that's the last time the Northern Cheyenne and Northern Arapaho would be fighting alongside the Southern Cheyenne and Southern Arapaho and the Lakota. So they're going to be separated after this. They're kind of going off already to their own corners, as it were. And future wars are not going to be punitive wars on the part of the Indians, like this one was, where they were going out to get revenge. They're going to be defensive from that point forward. And I've already uh, talked about the fact that gold had been discovered in Montana in the Powder River country, uh, and that uh, the Lakota there were starting to step up uh, their attacks on people traveling along the Bozeman Trail. And that's, that's where we're gonna go next. Although that's a different lecture and a different war, but it's coming right up. <laughs>